recording will be sent to the recording will be sent to all of those who register for the webinar and we will also put it on our YouTube channel. Next slide, please. So very briefly, before anyone who is unfamiliar with us, we are NCVO, that's the National Council for Voluntary Organisations, the largest network for charities and volunteering. We're proud to represent and support over 17,000 voluntary organisations of all sizes, from the very biggest household name charities to the smallest community groups. Our members range from big medical research charities, for example, to local amateur sports clubs. And at their heart, they all have the aim of making the world around them a better place. And DBS Checks is something that is applicable to all of you on the call right now, I'm sure. We'd love you to join us um, at NCBO. And if we just go into the next slide, I'm just gonna quickly talk through our membership. By becoming a member of NCVO, you can save time and money. And as a member, you get access to information and guidance, downloadable tools uh, and templates, discounted training, research, and much more. And if you are a small charity or a small um, community group with an income under £30,000, membership is free. Next slide, please. So a quick poll, which uh, my colleague Sophie is going to launch before we kick things off. What aspect of DBS checking are you finding most challenging? So there are four options there. It should have popped up on your screen. Understanding the level of check I need to do. Understanding if I need to do a check for a particular role. Knowing what costs are involved or all of the above. And of course, you can also add any other comments in the chat as well. Just give people a few more seconds to answer that. It's still going. Okay, I think we can close the, the poll there. I think most people, it, it's the second one, understanding if I need to do a check for a particular role that's come out. Okay, so if you can close the poll and I will hand over to Kathy Taylor. We're really pleased to have her here with us today from the DBS. Uh, thank you very much everyone for coming along and thank you to NCVO for inviting me today. So my name is Cathy Taylor and I am one of the regional outreach managers on the partnerships team and my role and the role of the regional outreach team is to support organisations like yourselves to help you understand all the complexities of DBS. So all our policies, our procedures and the legislation that we work under. At the end of the session, I will talk a little bit more about the regional outreach team and how they can support you as well. OK, so just a bit of an introduction about DBS. So the purpose of DBS is to protect the public. And we do this by helping employers and organisations who have staff and volunteers make safer recruitment decisions and by barring individuals who pose a risk to those working with vulnerable groups from working in vulnerable groups. So what is the role of the Disclosure and Barring Service? I know a lot of you will have heard of us, but you might not know exactly what we do. So we're responsible for delivering disclosure and barring functions for the government. So we operate our disclosure functions for England, Wales, Jersey, Guernsey and the Island of Man. And our disclosure functions are our DBS checks. So they're those certificates that you will request for certain roles to find out um, if the person has any criminal records or police information to help you make a suitability decision. 
So obviously we're all in England today, um, but if you were in Northern Ireland, you would be requesting a check from an organisation called Access NI. And if you're in Scotland, you would be requesting a check from Disclosure Scotland. And we also operate the barring functions for England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And the barring functions are two lists that we hold where people are referred to us if they are seen as a danger to those who are deemed as vulnerable, so children and adults in regulated activity. So there are two lists and we have the child children's barred list. And if you are on this list, you are barred from working or volunteering with children in regulated activity in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And if you are on the adults list, you are barred from working or volunteering in regulated activity with adults in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. In Scotland, Disclosure Scotland manage the barring functions, but if you are barred in Scotland, you are also barred in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And if you are barred in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, you're also barred in Scotland as well. So although our disclosure functions um, only cover England, Wales, Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man, no matter where you are in the UK, information will be disclosed on a criminal records part of a DBS certificate. And that is because all our information comes from the police national computer. Okay. So there are four different levels of DBS checks that can be applied for. The first level of DBS check that I'll talk about today is a basic DBS check and that is £18 and that is £18 whether you are an employee or a volunteer. A basic DBS check will show you unspent con convictions and conditional cautions. There is no legislation around a basic DBS check so anyone can apply for a basic DBS check or be asked to apply for a basic DBS check and I will go into more detail later on about how you can apply for a basic DBS check. We do find that the main um, customers for our basic DBS checks are organisations such as Amazon and Deliveroo. We did see during the COVID pandemic a real increase in our basic check business from organisations in the gig economy. The next level of checks that I'll talk about are checks that have legislation surrounding them. They do have a cost um, and the cost is on the screen there. The cost I'm putting up on the screen is the cost that DBS charges for these checks. You do have to access them by a registered body or an umbrella body who will charge an admin fee. If you are a volunteer, standard and enhanced checks are free from DBS, but your um, umbrella body or registered body will also charge an admin fee and DBS have no control over that admin fee, so they do vary from organisation to organisation. So a standard DBS check is £18 or like I say free for a volunteer. A legislation for um, a standard DBS check comes under the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act exemptions order and it will show you spent and unspent convictions and cautions subject to filtering and I will talk in a little bit more detail about filtering as we go along. So the most part standard checks covers specific roles such as registering to become a barrister, people who work in the judicial court system and those who work in healthcare but don't deliver healthcare but they have contact with patients. So really a standard DBS check is for roles named in legislation. Um, one of the ones that I always say I think is really interesting is if you are a football steward you are eligible for a standard check but no other sporting groups have this eligibility. And then if we moved on to our enhanced checks again DBS will charge £38 for these checks but they are free for volunteers. An enhanced DBS check will show you the same information that you have on a standard check, but it will also contain what we call relevant police intelligence. And this is information that Chief Police Officer believes ought to be disclosed because of the role applied for or the workforce applied for. And this information can be things like allegations which have not led to a caution or a conviction 
um, or inv ongoing investigations or concerns that the police may have. Um, stand, um, eligibility for enhanced checks is set out in the Police Regulations Act and it mainly co covers people that work with vulnerable adults but not in regulated activity and those that work with children but not in regulated activity. And then the next level of check we have is the enhanced with a barred list check. Again, this is £38 or free if you are a volunteer. It will show you the same information that we have on our enhanced checks, but it will also contain a check of one or both of the barred lists, depending on whether you are working with children, adults or both. And these are for roles that are in regulated activity. And in order to make sure that a person is not barred from regulated activity with the relevant workforce, you need to carry out an enhanced with barred list check. Okay. So as I mentioned on our standard and our enhanced DBS checks, we do apply something called filtering. And if I just say filtering, you kind of think, well, what does that mean? So I'll go back in a little bit of time. So when we first started doing DBS checks, all convictions, cautions and reprimands and final warnings were disclosed on a check. We were taken to the European Court of Human Rights in 2013 and the Supreme Court ruled that disclosing all spent and unspent convictions was in a breach of the European Convention on Human Rights and therefore we were instructed to implement a filtering regime which would take off certain offences which due to um, the time served they may not seem to be relevant anymore. Again, we were taken back to the Supreme Court in 2020 and we had to do new filtering rules. So the current rules are, is if we are looking at a conviction on a certificate, we will look at all convictions individually and a conviction will be filtered from a criminal record certificate only if 11 years have elapsed since the date of conviction or five and a half years if a person was under 18 when convicted. It didn't result in a custodial or a suspended sentence. So basically the person didn't go and serve their sentence in prison or were under a condition that if they committed any more offences or broke the licence would be sent to prison. And it's not on the DBS list of specified offences that will never be filtered. So on the DBS website, there is a long list of offences that will never be taken off the DBS certificate. And these offences are set out in legislation. And it's because these are usually really serious sexual or violent offences. You can have a look on the DBS website and read the list if you want to. It's got a lot of different things on there, ranging from, like I said, those serious sexual offences to piracy, to throwing firebombs. They're the type of things that will never be taken off your DBS certificate. Then we have cautions, reprimands and final warnings. A caution for adults will be filtered after six years have elapsed since the date of caution and only if it doesn't appear on those list of specified offences that will never be filtered. Youth cautions are now not disclosed on DBS certificates and childhood reprimands and warnings will not automatically be disclosed. So with our enhanced certificates, I did mention that there was a section for police intelligence. So in this section, the police still have the power to disclose any information that has been filtered off a certificate if they believe it's still relevant and it ought to be disclosed. So at the DBS, we do have a service called the DBS Update Service, and this allows individuals who have standard or enhanced checks to put their, uh, to subscribe to the update service and register their DBS check with ourselves. And this means that if an employee or a volunteer has um, a DBS certificate for the same workforce at the same level and they are looking to go to a different organisation or they are having more checks done within an organisation, they can ask the organisation checking them to go online and check free of charge whether the DBS certificate is still current. 
So for individuals, it is £13 to subscribe to the update service, and that's £13 a year. And you can put as many certificates as you like onto the update service. If you are a volunteer, the update service is free. So if you are an individual who would like to subscribe to the update service, you can do this either when you first apply for your standard or enhanced checks, and you can use the application number and register your certificate. Then if you then have a certificate um, issued to you, you have 30 days to subscribe to the update service. So if you're an organisation and you would like to use the update service to see whether someone who's already subscribed to it, DBS check, um, is current, what you can do is with their permission, you can check online and that is free for you as an organisation. So those making the checks will be advised either no new information exists or if the certificate contains no relevant information. So if you see you will to use the update service you do need to see the certificate that is linked to the update service because you will not actually be told what the information is on a dbs certificate at this point so if you're happy with the no new information exists or the certificate contain no relevant information you wouldn't need to request a new dbs check because that's telling you that the certificate that you are seeing is current you might be told new information exists and at that point you would want to do a new dbs check to find out what that new information is because the update service won't tell you what the information is and then you might be told there's no record of the certificate in the service and if that's the case you'd want to do a new check to make sure that the certificate is current so there are benefits for both organizations and individuals signing up to the update service and i think the main one is faster results so you'll know instantly whether you would need to do a new dbs check or not so that would lead to you being able to um, get the person either working for you or volunteering sooner and for an individual it's good because it just helps the portability of a dbs certificate okay so how do you decide at what level of check you can request a dbs check for so you need to think about each individual role and then you need to think about who does your organisation provide services for? Is it adults? Is it children? Is it both? Then what does the role actually involve? So what does it do? So there are certain roles that are set out in legislation which have eligibility for certain levels of check. And then you need to think how often is a role performed, because sometimes when you're working with children or you're working with adults, it they then may change the um, level of check you're able to apply for. And then you need to consider when working with children, is the work supervised or not? And that's the case of if some roles are supervised, it will change their eligibility. And then you need to think about where is the role performed, because there's certain places that are set on legislation, such as care homes or school, which will change the eligibility for a DBS check. OK, there are some different rules for roles in Wales, but as you're all England today, I don't need to go into those. And I do have a link here on the screen, which takes you to our collection of leaflets. So on our website, we do have a number of leaflets and guides which will support you in understanding eligibility a little bit better. Okay, so for our enhanced checks, we do have three different workforces. And these workforces are the child workforce, and that covers work with children. Then we have the adults workforce, which covers work with adults. And then we have the uh, other workforce and that covers all other workforces. And these are usually roles such as taxi drivers, security licensing authorities. Okay, so now we'll look at children in a little bit more detail. So the, for a DBS purposes and under legislation, a child is a person who's not yet reached they reach the age of 18. So for our highest level of checks, which is enhanced with children's barred list check, a person needs to be carrying out regulated activity to be eligible for this level of check. 
So what is regulated activity? So in legislation, these roles are set out that if they meet the conditions, they are eligible for the enhanced with children's barred list check. So the first one we'll look at is providing health care. So providing healthcare only needs to be done once to become regulated activity. And when we talk about providing healthcare, we mean healthcare provided by a healthcare professional or someone acting under their direction or supervision. Then we have providing personal care with children and that only needs to be done once for that to become regulated activity. So the definition of personal care is where help is provided with eating and drinking because a child is ill or has disability or where help is provided with toileting, washing and dressing because of a child's age, illness and disability. If we then move on to unsupervised teaching, training and instruction, unsupervised for caring for or supervising of children and providing advice or guidance on physical, emotional or educational well-being. So these things need to be done more than three days in a 30 day period or once overnight with the opportunity for contact between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. for them to become regulated activity. If the role is supervised, if the teaching, training and instruction and caring for or supervising of children, it would still be eligible for a DBS check. It would just be an enhanced DBS check at this point. And under DBS legislation, there is no definition of supervision. We would always say, think about the definition of supervision you would find in a dictionary or have a look at the definition that the Department for Education gives about supervision and make the decision within your organisation to see whether you would say a role is sufficiently supervised. Um, if these three roles that I've just mentioned are done less than three days in a 30 day period, they are still eligible for an enhanced DBS check. The next one we have is driving children under an arrangement. And when I talk about driving children under an arrangement, I mean this is part of someone's job or volunteering role. It's not an informal arrangement between parents, for example. This has to be done more than three days in a 30 day period for it to become regulated activity. If it's done less often, it is eligible for an enhanced check. The next one we have is moderating a web based service and this sounds really complicated as a term but a web based service is things like your chat rooms, your social media, so um, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, whatever the latest web based service is. And when we say the web based service, it has to be mainly or wholly for children with the opportunity to access and modify content and interact with users to become um, a definition of a web based service in this case. And for it to be eligible for an enhanced with children's barred list check, it needs to be done more than three days in a 30 day period. If it's done less often, it is eligible for an enhanced check. In legislation, registering to be a child minder or registering to be a foster carer um, is set out as regulated activity. And if you are a day to day manager of staff or volunteers who carry out regulated activity, you are also eligible for an enhanced with children's barred list check. So if you are working in what we call a specified establishment, which I'll go into a bit more detail now, and you aren't doing any of the activities listed on the previous slide, you might be eligible for an Enhanced with Children's Barred List check if you meet certain criteria. So if you are doing any activity in a school, a nursery, a children's home, a children's centre, a childcare premises, a children's hospital in Wales, or a detention centre for children, these are called specified establishments and they're set out in legislation because of the opportunity for contact a person would have. So if you are doing activity in any of these places and you satisfy all of the criteria of working there more than three days in a 30 day period or overnight between 6 a.m. between 
between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. and have the opportunity for contact with the children in the establishment and are working there for the purpose of the establishment. And it's not a temporary or occasional or supervised volunteer role. You would be eligible for an enhanced with um, children's barred list check. So there is activity which is not regulated that is eligible for DBS checks in the children's workforce. So as said earlier, we have that supervised teaching, instruction, caring for or supervising of children is eligible for an enhanced check. If you are a supervised volunteer in a school or any of those specified establishments, you are eligible for enhanced checks. If you are living or working in a child minding or child care premises, you are eligible for an enhanced with children's barred list check. Anyone who's carrying out one of those regulated activities, but they're not doing it often enough, is eligible for an enhanced check. If you're a trustee of a children's charity, you are eligible for an enhanced DBS check. And if you're registering to be an adoptive parent, it's set out in legislation that you are eligible for an enhanced with the check of the children's barred list. So work with adults. So the work with adults, adult workforce for DBS purposes, an adult is anybody who is aged 18 or over. So regulated activity with adults is a lot simpler than it is with children. And that is because these activities only need to be done once to become regulated activity. So like with children, we have providing health care and providing personal care. So the definition of providing um, health care is the same as it is with children, but the definition of providing personal care is slightly different with adults. And that definition for adults is supporting or prompting or assisting somebody with eating, drinking, toileting, washing, dressing, oral care, care of skin, hair or nails for health reasons only because of a person's age, illness or disability. Then we have social work provided by a social care worker to an adult who is a client or a potential client. We have assistance with the day to day financial running of an adult's own household. So like with the driving of children, this needs to be part of someone's job or volunteering role. And it is linked to if you are managing someone's cash, paying their bills or doing their shopping for them. Then we have assistance with the conduct of an adult's affairs. So when we talk about conduct of an adult's affairs, this suitability decision is made by the Office of Public Guardian if they decide to invoke their right to do so. And then we have conveying an adult and conveying means moving an adult from place to place. And when we talk about conveying an adult for it to become regulated activity, it must be for health care reasons, personal care reasons or social care reasons due to their age, illness or disability. So now we're going to go into work with adults which is not regulated activity but is eligible for an enhanced check in the adults workforce and this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. So there are three steps you need to follow to decide if a role is eligible for an enhanced check in the adult workforce and the first thing you need to do is look at is the person aged 18 or over and are they receiving a listed health or social care service or receiving a listed activity set out in legislation? So as you'll see, when I'm doing my um, workshops and webinars, I talk about vulnerable adults. And I know this is a term that people don't particularly like. People prefer adults at risk. But the reason why I use the term vulnerable adults is that's how it's set out in legislation that DBS operates under. Um, so vulnerable adults is a very subjective term because anyone can be vulnerable at any point. But in our legislation, it sets out when we would deem an adult to be vulnerable and to be able to and get an enhanced with barred, um, sorry, an enhanced check with the adult workforce, you need to be in the group set out in legislation. So the type of groups that we are talking about are those that are living in residential accommodation for care or nursing, 
those are in sheltered housing, someone who needs support, care or assistance, develop capacity to live independently, being provided with care or assistance because of age, illness or disability in the place where they live, anyone detained in prison or remand or removal centre, those on probation, and also those who are receiving a service because of their age, illness or disability. In our working with adults guidance, we do have an annex called Annex A, and this goes into lots of detail about this. Okay, so once you've established that you can, that the adult that you're working with falls into step one, you'd move on to step two. And that is that the individual that you are checking must do one or more of the activities of teaching, training, instructing, providing assistance, advice or guidance, caring for, supervising, providing treatment or therapy, moderating a public interactive electronic communication service, work in a care home or driving adults under contract arrangements. And then you must see how often a person is doing this role. To be eligible for the enhanced and adults workforce check, they must be doing it more than three days in any period of 30 days or any time between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. or once a week on an ongoing basis. If you can't answer yes to all of these questions, the individual wouldn't be eligible for an enhanced check in the adult workforce. So there are some work with adults that are eligible for DBS checks that don't fall into the categories that I've just said. And one of those is if you are a trustee of an adult's charity, then there are certain positions in England and Wales where it's set in legislation that they are eligible for a certain level of check. And then if you manage anyone who carries out work with adults activities, you are eligible for that enhanced check as well. So we do have um, the eligibility guidance, so you'll be able to click on there and have a look at more detail of that guidance. So if you are a charity trustee, the level of check that you're uh, um, eligible for depends on what type of charity you are. So if you are a children's charity, and that is a charity that is children's charity, if the workers or volunteers include those that work out, carry work out, carry work carry out work that falls into the legal definition of regulated activity with children as the main part of their activity. So it wouldn't be that you happen to be a faith charity who might run a youth club. It needs to be the main part of the activity you do. And if you are defined as a children's charity, you become eligible for an enhanced check if you are a trustee. If you are an adult charity, so a charity if um, the charity workers or volunteers include those that carry out work that falls into the legal definition of work with adults or regulated activity with adults, you would be eligible for an enhanced check. And again, this must be not incidental work. It must be the main focus of your charity. So if you are not a children's charity or an adult charity, trustees wouldn't be eligible for anything higher than a basic. But can I just caveat that you always need to think about what else is your trustee doing? Because they may have a role in your charity that would make them eligible for a higher level of check, for example, if they were carrying out regulated activity with children. Hey, so I just want to give you some statistics around DBS checks now. So. I've got these hot off the press figures um, for how many DBS checks we produced in the last financial year. So as you can see, it was a really strong year for our standard and enhanced products with intake exceeding 5 million checks. And this was the highest volume since the start of DBS. And we delivered 10% more um, checks in 22-23 than we did in 21-22. And our increased volumes did um, continue to be driven by everyone getting back to business as usual following the end of COVID lockdowns. Because what we did find, there was less things going on in communities in terms of things like regulated activities. Um, so we did get a drop in our requests for standard and enhanced checks during the COVID pandemic. Um, but we are back to doing even more checks. 
Um, we also are getting more checks because there's been increased funding in care, education and medical sectors. Um, and also we did continue to offer the COVID fast and free checks, which um, were based for the care and medical sectors about backfilling during the COVID pandemic. So in terms of our achievements, we do have targets that we want to achieve for how long it takes us to get DBS checks out to yourselves. So we aim to get 82% of basic checks done within two days. As you can see, last financial year, we got 82.5 checks done and it took an average of 1.1 day for a DBS basic check to be done. 80% was our standard check. So we want to do 80% within five days. We got 94.7 and the majority of our standard checks were getting done in 1.6 days. We did have a goal to get 80% of our enhanced checks done within 14 days. Unfortunately, we just missed out on that target with only 78.4% done, but the average amount of um, checks were being done in seven point, actually 10.7 days. And on average, we process 638,000 DBS checks every single month. So with our DBS checks that are produced, 97% contain no information. On average, 2.8% included police national computer data after auto filtering was produced and 0.1% of checks include police intelligence and that's for our enhanced checks only. Okay. So just want to go into a little bit of detail about the enhanced check process uh, because that is the most complex pro um, DBS check we offer. So it is a four stage process and this is what happens after it comes to ourselves. So as you can see at stage one we receive applications. So we might get paper application forms or them online and the first thing we do with our paper application forms are check for errors and omissions. If an error or omission is found they'll be returned to the registered body or umbrella body within 24 hours um, or in some cases the application will be withdrawn. Applications which are submitted over ebulk will automatically be rejected if the data fails validation or a mandatory field isn't completed. Um, so it's really important that if you're submitting DBS checks, that you ensure the application is checked before submission. Then at stage two, it's where information goes to the police and national computer for checking. So we will check key data from the application against the information held on the police national computer, and we search for any potential matches. Where the DBS is unsure of a match, we'll invite the applicant to provide fingerprints at a police station. At stage three, we will look at the adults and children's barred list check, if it is an enhanced with barred list check, to make sure that there is no information there. And then at stage four, we carry out um, the police intelligence. So enhanced checks are sent securely and electronically to the police for an additional check of records before the information is sent back to the DBS. And that's in terms of that. And then at stage five, certificates are printed and posted to the applicant. So sometimes people are telling us that their checks are taking longer than they expected. So there are a number of reasons why this can be. A lot of people will think as soon as they submit the check to their registered body or umbrella body, we receive the check. That's not always true. So it might be a delay of your registered body or umbrella body submitting the check to us. Sometimes application forms aren't fully completed or we've got inaccurate data. So at that point, we will have to either withdraw the application or contact you. You know, really common things are an applicant's name can be misspelt. There'll be a recent name change, which an applicant has failed to disclose or address um, history is inaccurate. We might have that a person has lived in multiple addresses, and if that's the case, we may have to be checking with a number of police forces. Quite often, we get people saying to us they have been stuck at the police stage for a long time, and that might be because 
stage four is the most complex pay part of our process um, and it can be a number of reasons why something might be stuck at stage four it might be the police have a backlog of applications or there are technical issues with the police national computer or convictions may have occurred which require further investigation or initial evidence is required for certain fines so it might be that it's taken a long time because we have to find out more information. And it can also be the case that an individual's records have to be sent to a number of police forces. So there's 52 police forces and law enforcement agencies across the UK. And um, for some people, it might need to go to 52 police forces. Also, we do quality assure a certain number of our DBS checks. Um, so some will go to a quality assurance process, which can make things a little bit longer. And also there may be postal delays. As you're aware, before Christmas, we did have some severe postal strikes and that led to a delay in checks going out to people, which was beyond our control. So if you think a check is taken longer than you expected, I would always say to you, first of all, contact your registered body or umbrella body to check what date it was submitted. We have, um, as you are an organisation, you can't request the um, information about the check yourself by contacting DBS. You would have to get the applicant to. An applicant can check online to see where this, to, their check is up to and contact customer services if they have any questions. If um, an applicant's check is at stage four for more than 60 days, we do have a service level agreement with the police force that they should return um, police information to us after 60 days. If that hasn't happened, contact customer services and they will escalate the process. If an applicant hasn't received their certificate when it's at stage five after 10 days, they can request a free certificate reprint. So you can request a basic DBS check yourself in, and it's really, really easy to do. The information is there on the website. So I'm not going to go through in much detail because I'm really conscious I'm going into the questions and answer change um, section there. Or you can go via a respons responsible organisation who will submit the check on your behalf. But I would recommend that you just do it online yourselves because it'll be a lot cheaper and it's really quick. It took four hours for me to do a basic check. Um, if you are requesting a standard or enhanced check, you will have to go through an umbrella body or a registered body to find out um, who registered bodies are and the service that they can offer you. We do have a list of them on the DBS website and you can search using a number of filters to see what the best umbrella body for your organisation will be. As I say, they all charge different things but they all offer different services. And we do have some resources available online for you. Like I say, we have our eligibility guidance and we do have some guidance around basic checks. And you can contact um, ourselves. So you can contact myself and the regional outreach team in a number of ways. You can email us and I'll give you more um, the personalised details in a moment on the next slide. Um, if you need to contact customer services about anything to do with checks, you can email them or you can give them a ring. If you need to speak to Barring about anything, you can contact them via email or ring them. We have got a website with lots of information on, so please feel free to have a look and explore that. And we are on Facebook and Twitter. So if you would like to follow us, please do. We always post interesting information on our Facebook and our Twitter pages. And please get in touch with us if you would like any bespoke support as well. So we do have regional outreach offices in each of the regions of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. We are currently recruiting for our North East person, but they will be in post for the beginning of July. In the meantime, you can contact um, just the regional outreach general email address and myself or one of the team members will pick up and support you. So we can do a number of things, including deliver workshops like this or answer questions and queries that you may have around DBS. So I will pass us on now to do some questions and answers. So I know Amy is going to bombard me now because I can see there's lots of questions in the questions and answers box. 
There are indeed, Cathy. Um, thank you. That was extremely thorough, as always. Um, there's a lot of questions in, guys. Um, I am going to amalgamate quite a few of your questions um, into a few common themes I've seen come through. Um, and hopefully, Cathy can give some quick fire answers. For those questions we don't get to, we are going to put together an FAQ document. Cathy has kindly offered to do that. So we will make sure your question is answered. Okay. How often should we update um, a DBS check? Can DBS checks be transferred between roles or does a new one need to be done in a new role? And they are two of our most asked questions. And I always say, if I had a pound for every time I was asked that question, I wouldn't be standing here today. So in terms <laughs> of how often you should check a DBS check, I can't give you the answer to that because there is no legislation surrounding it. It is up to yourself as an organisation to make that decision. DBS checks don't have an expiry date, but I want you to remember that a DBS check will only give you information about a person's um, criminal record, history and police intelligence up to the day it was published. So. For those checks that aren't on the update service, you need to think about how often you feel as an organisation you need to renew a DBS certificate. You will find that some regulatory bodies will give you a time frame, others won't. In terms of can DBS checks be transferred between organisations, the answer is yes. So a DBS check belongs to an individual. It doesn't belong to the organisation who has requested it for them on their behalf. So if the role is a similar role for the same workforce and the same DBS check level, um, you could accept that check and an individual could move around with that check. But again, for those checks that aren't on the update service, I'd always say, you know, how long ago was it done and does it need to be updated? Okay, for example, you might have someone who's got a DBS check that's 10 years old you'd want to say, well, would you want to accept that because you don't know what's happened in the past 10 years that might, ch might change a person's suitability. Brilliant. Thanks, Cathy. Um, there is a lot of questions around checking ID and kind of difficulties that present themselves. There was one, there was a question around checking ID um, for those from overseas or, uh, for example, refugees or asylum seekers, are there any workarounds when ID documents are not easily um, obtainable? Yeah, and this is a really, again, common question and theme that we get because it's not just asylum seekers or refugees that might not have the ID that's needed, especially as we're moving more forward to using digital IDs, but also because things like your bank statements and mobile phone bills and things like that everything's online nowadays and we can't accept those so what we would always say that if a person doesn't have the documents you can follow the fingerprint route so you can tick a box on the application which says i think it's w59 which says that the applicant doesn't have the suitable id and what happens then dbs will write out to the applicant to get permission to um, send their details to a police force and the police force will contact them to do a fingerprint check and unfortunately without the correct ID we can only use the fingerprint method. Um, there is no extra additional charge because we do get queries sometimes that people have gone to get the fingerprints done and the police have tried to charge them. It is not a point of charge for an individual when they get the fingerprints done the police force will charge DBS, so don't worry about that. Thanks, Cathy. And on a similar note around um, checking uh, document ver verification, I think during COVID, some of the rules were, were changed to allow that to be done um, over a video call like this and has now reverted back, somebody has said. Um, do you want to talk us through what the current situation is? Yeah, so technically... There was always an option to check documents remotely and that was just flagged up um, as more prominent during the COVID period. 
You can still check documents remotely. There has been no change in that for DBS. The right to work document checks has changed and that caused a lot of confusion because we stayed the same because we've always said you can check documents remotely, whereas right to work has changed. So we are saying, yes, you can still check documents remotely, but to always ensure that you see those documents physically in person as soon as you can as well. So, for example, if the person's starting work and physically is going into an office, you should try and see those documents as soon as you can. One of the new things that we are rolling out is in it's called digital service providers. It's IDSP. I can never remember what the I stands for, but basically I think identity document service providers, possibly. But it means now that some umbrella bodies and some registered bodies will support applicants to use um, digital methods to check their ID. And it's things like scanning your passport with your mobile phone and answering questions that would verify your address. So quite a few RBs are moving forward doing that. So that takes away the need to actually check a person's ID. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we had a couple of questions around using the update service, Cathy. Um, just bear with me one second. How? Oh gosh, sorry. Um, how? What? What does an organisation need in place? Um, and how do they use this to perform a, a DBS check on a new volunteer, for example? So the organisation doesn't need to have anything in place. You don't have to register for the update service because everything is with the individual. So if the individual is registered with the update service, they will be able to share a code with you, which they add information about how to log on and you will log on, pop in the code that they give you and that will take you to their um, special page. So they will share all the information with you. So you don't need to sign up to the update service yourself. It'd be the volunteer or the employee that's already got all those details to share with you. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'll just try and cover a few quick ones. Are basic checks really of any value if the roles are not eligible for um, a higher level of check? So a DBS check helps employers make safer recruitment decisions. So you need to decide that if your role isn't eligible for a standard or enhanced check, what would be the use of knowing a basic for yourselves? So it might be, you know, obviously I I always say Amazon are one of our biggest um, people that use basic checks. So for them, they see a value in it because they want to know about probably an applicant, how trustworthy an applicant is. But this is up to yourself. I couldn't recommend or not recommend a basic check. It's what would the value be to your organisation? Brilliant. And this is going to be my final question. We will make sure we answer them all, though, don't worry. Um, what are the consequences, Cathy, of um, knowingly applying for a higher level of check than a role is, is eligible for? And there was a mention in the comments around kind of a partner organisation asking for, for people to apply for this role, even though it wouldn't be eligible. Yeah, so that's a really difficult one. And that is where we would hope that your umbrella body or your registered body would flag up that the role at that stage wasn't eligible for a check at that level. And we do find that we do get people register bodies and umbrella bodies will push back and question why you are asking for a higher level of check when the role isn't eligible for that but as an individual if you feel that you are being asked for a higher level of check than it is relevant you can actually take legal action against a person um, or an organization so there is information on the DBS website and I will put that in the frequently asked questions about what to do if you feel you've been asked for a higher level of check when you shouldn't have been done. Um, sometimes people will ask for a higher level of check because they don't understand eligibility. And we do find we're getting a lot of funders and people, especially in the local authority, we're finding local authorities are asking charities for certain levels of DBS checks for roles which don't meet the eligibility. So we are, we are supporting you know, organisations, charities to push back to say, actually, no, this role doesn't meet eligibility. So 
I cannot ask for this level of check. Um, and then we get the other way around as well, that people have gone to their umbrella bodies for a certain role and the umbrella body is saying, no, that's not eligible for the check. And we're helping organisations say, right, under legislation, this is where it meets. And it can be sometimes with umbrella bodies, if you've got a job description of um, communications officer and you're interested an enhanced with children's borderless check, the umbrella body might go, well, why would a communications manager need this level of check? And it turns out that in the job description, the communications manager is managing the social media for the organisation. So things like that. Thanks, Cathy. We're going to have to draw things to a close. I think we're, if you've got any queries about specific roles, we'd always recommend that you contact your regional outreach advisor, right, Cathy? And yeah. We'll those details. Yeah. Um, can I just move on to the next slide quickly? Yep. Oh, good. There we go. So we will send all of this information out to you in um, the follow up emails. I'm not going to go through this now. Just the next slide, please, Cathy. We've just got a quick poll, um, which my colleague Sophie is going to launch to get your initial thoughts on how you found today's webinar. Would be really grateful for those still on the call if you could answer this for us. And there are two questions. Gives us a really good idea on um, what we can do to improve this. It's completely anonymous and it will not be made public. In addition to this, when you leave the webinar, Zoom will launch a longer feedback poll. If you've got a couple of minutes before you rush off to your next thing, we would really appreciate it if you could fill this in. I am aware that there were many questions. It's a complicated topic that always inspires uh, lots of questions. And we will make sure to to answer those. Um, I could see a lot of themes running through the questions and I tried to just pick out a few questions that covered those, um, but we will come to those. And I would encourage you as well um, to have a look at our own DBS guidance on the NCVO website, which we have recently updated with Kathy's help. Um, so hopefully that, that should be really clear and we will put all of this in the follow up as well. Thank you, everybody. Lots of really nice uh, thank yous in the chat for you there, Cathy. Well, oh, brilliant. Well, thank you everyone for coming along today and I hope you found it useful. Thanks everyone. Please do fill in uh, the feedback form if you've got a couple of minutes after, after the session.